following. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the a man may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer and the, giving us the opportunity to naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins, which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are our God, a God of grace and mercy, and a God of righteousness and justice. We thank you that you have revealed the great and mighty things in your word that inspire us, that satisfy our soul. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate this morning. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I guess for three weeks now I was going to show you a PowerPoint on rainbows. We're way past rainbows now, but it's always pleasant looking at rainbows, isn't it? And we were studying it for some reason. I didn't show them, so I thought that would be the first thing I do today or else we'll be getting further and further away from them uh, from when we were studying these rainbows. And so <clears throat> I have a few of them here. Yeah, you should kill those lights. There's one there. These aren't sh- photoshopped or anything. These are actual rainbows. If I was driving down the road and I had a camera, I would stop and take that one for sure. There's two on there. Double rainbow. Yeah, well, there's, <coughs> there's another one out, outside there. You can see it better on the computer, but... Um, And there's one, all the different colors. And I'm going to refrain, excuse me, from venting my ire about how the LGBT group has stolen the rainbow, uh, the meaning. Actually, they haven't, but a lot of people, when they see a rainbow now, rather than thinking about the promise of God that he's not going to destroy the earth again, excuse me, by a flood, They think of that organization. You can see the different colors in that one. Now this is one I took at my house. That's why it's kind of blurry. Let's see. Um, This is... It doesn't show near as good on here, but you can see it coming here and here. And this is my Martin Hotel here. (laughs) There's one right there. They'll be coming before long. I have to clean it out. And I just love to watch them fly. They're expert pilots. And so I don't know how many zones. There's a lot of holes in there. And there's been times that they're just like a beehive. Anyhow, um, I think that's all. Oh, no, that's going to be coming up. That's for, I don't know. We'll probably get there today. So I'll just uh, I'll just keep that in reserve. What do you think about when you see a rainbow? Yeah, first of all, you think about how beautiful it is, but I always think that's the Lord's signature in the sky. That's how He signed the covenant, His promise to us. One of many uh, covenants and promises. Also, uh, last Sunday, I spent the whole time, instead of being in major, major Bible events in Genesis, which is where we're going to continue today, I was in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1 and verse 14, and there uh, we are admonished to open our mouth and speak. And I thought that would be a good time to encourage everyone, including myself, to look for opportunities to speak and, and either give the gospel or else just 
If someone has an issue, a problem with something in life, you might give them a few scriptures to go to or comment on some doctrine that you have. Uh, this is what we are here for. We are ambassadors of Christ, and he has given us the gospel, the message to give to others. In other words, the way that God reaches unbelievers is through you and through me. You don't have to be a pastor or evangelist. Every believer is required or commanded uh, to give the gospel. Also, I had a, well, I, I guess I, I can show you this right here. Um, this is how I ended last time with uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 10 through 13. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. Give deference to others. And then in red is what the focus was. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You see this throughout the Bible. You should have vigor. You, you should have spudazzo. Y'all remember that word? It's the Greek word that means to uh, be eager, be hungry. And we are given this again here. Then verse 12, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. You want a strong spiritual life? There they are, right there. Rejoicing in hope. Hope there is the uh, Greek word elpis, and it means confidence. The more you study the word, the more you can connect the dots in the spiritual realm, the more confidence you're going to have. And you need confidence in a society that has gone to the dark side, that's pretty much turned their back on God. You need to speak boldly. You need to speak with dogmatism. Be audacious when you're giving the gospel or when you're talking about God, but also know what you're talking about. So rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation. All of us are going to have tribulation and devoted to prayer. It's prayer that is so important there. I don't know why these things keep popping up, but they do. Verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. And on that note, I gave an opportunity for everyone out there to be able to exercise their spiritual gift. We have a large demographic of senior citizens in our church family. Several of them are not here because they can't be. They, just, they, they don't even get out anymore. Most of them are located in nursing homes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I said we need a senior coordinator in order to coordinate the efforts of the people in the church ministering to these people. And I said, I, I gave that opportunity last Sunday. I said, I will do it again today, which I'm doing, for you to think about and pray about where the Lord would have you to be on this senior team. Not necessarily the, the one in charge, the coordinator, but if you want to be part of the senior team, you need to let me know. The senior team would be those who... Uh, either call the old folks or whether you uh, go and visit them, uh, run errands for them, whatever it is, uh, the coordinator will be able to handle that. So if you want to be on the team or be the coordinator, uh, let us know. You can let me know or one of the deacons. But I don't want it to be on the, uh, an impulse. Think about it. Because this is over the long haul. We need someone to stick with it and meet the needs of these seniors. In fact, uh, I understand that Pastor Bob was in the hospital. Mary, is he out? Or? No, not yet. Okay. Okay, he's in Scott and White in Brenham here. And all of us, uh, I mean, that's not that far away, uh, have the opportunity to drop in on him and say, hey, uh, just want to let you know we love you and we're praying for you and hope you recover. Doesn't have to be a big, long deal, but... Uh, I know that that would encourage him. Yes, Cindy. Is that the pastor of, of the Brenham Bible Church? No, no, that, that's uh, Dr. Uh, Bruce Baker. This is Dr. Bob. The, uh, yeah, I said Pastor Bob. I was trying to did I say Pastor Bob? Uh -huh. yeah. 
Oh, I'm sorry about that. No, it's Dr. Bob. My, my first thought was... Yeah, I, I understand. That's confusing. Um, Dr. Bob and Weta. Weta played the, the piano for how long was it? 10 or 15 years? She said she was going to fill in. She said, I'll only, I'll only do it for about three or four weeks. <laughs> and was here for about 15 years, something like that. Phenomenal believers. Anyway, um, I wanted to get that uh, out of the way. Plus one more thing that has to do with um, a verse that I was going, some verses I was going to read, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to read them today. But if you want to... Go to them on your own time. The scriptures are Leviticus chapter 19, verse 23, through Leviticus 20, verse 5. They're not really that germane to my message today. It had to do more with that last week's message, but that's Leviticus 19, 23, through Leviticus 20, verse 5. And these verses deal with tattoos, Skin cutting, mohawk haircuts, mediums, and weights, just weights and weighing in, in business, fair business practices. Now, you might be doubting where the, the Bible talks about mohawk haircuts. Well, it doesn't say mohawk haircuts, but it, the, the Israelites were... Uh, not allowed to cut the sides of their hair like this and what it actually meant doing it so far that it winds up just being a mohawk on top and also cutting the beard certain ways. Anyway, if you're interested in that, go to those verses and there's a lot to say about it. <clears throat> it underscores what I told you about the Canaanites going into the land of Canaan and how they despoiled it in such a way that when the Israelites did take over the land, God did not allow them to eat the fruit of the fruit trees for four years because it took that long in God's eyes for it to be edible because the land had been so um, influenced by evil. Okay, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 21. Now you'll notice that Genesis 10, 21 is pretty much in the middle of genealogy. I know how excited y'all are to come to church and learn about genealogy of the Israelites. Of course, I say that sarcastically, tongue-in-cheek. And you also probably noticed I didn't read all the lines here, all these names that I guess only a Hebrew scholar could produce, uh, pronounce correctly. But the reason that we're, we ended at Genesis 10, 21 is because we start to get the genealogy of Shem. Now, it started in verse 6 giving the genealogy of the sons of Ham, no, excuse me, in verse 1, with the genealogy of the sons of Japheth. Remember, uh, Shem, Ham, Japheth are the three sons of Noah. We all come from this line. And so you have Japheth's line giving, and then Ham's sons given his genealogy. And in verse 21, we pick up Shem. And right off the bat in this verse, if you are reading a New American Standard Version Bible, you may get confused. And I'm going to try to alleviate that, that uh, confusion and illustrate that there are things that we can glean from genealogy that are very important for us to, uh, to remember for instance, let's go back for just a moment before we get back. On verse 8, this is under the sons of Ham. <clears throat> it says, now Cush became the father of Nimrod. You might underscore that name because that's an important player in this genealogy and of that time. Cush was the son of Ham and 
Nimrod was the son of Cush. He became mighty on the earth. He was a mighty, evil dictator is what he became. Verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He hunted men. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And then verse 10, put a little marker there because this is important. It's all important, but this is significant. In the beginning of the kingdom, of, of his kingdom, was Babel. And then Eric and Akkad and uh, Kalna in the land of Shinar. So this is telling us, and we're going to go right in to chapter 11 in a moment. In chapter 11, the first nine verses has to do with the Tower of Babel. And he was the one that built the city and the tower. He was the mover and shaker behind this initiative to build the Tower of Babel and the city and so forth. And here we have it right here in verse 10. <clears throat> so now we'll go back over here to Genesis chapter 10 again in verse 21. And we start to have the sons of, <clears throat> of Shem. So the etymology of Shem is given in verses 21 through 32. And Shem is the father of the Jewish race and all of the Arabic peoples. And he had five sons. And when we see the sons given in Genesis, their names several times, it's always <coughs> Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But that's not the order of their birth. You would think that Shem would be the eldest, but he isn't. Because the, the reason that he is given first in the, in, this, in the names given of Noah's son is because from his line came Messiah. And so he had priority and thus he is named first. And when you get to verse 21, then if you have a New American Standard Version, you may uh, be a little surprised at this. I'm going to put it on the board so everyone can see it. I have the New American Standard Version given first, and it's, it's, it's difficult to read You'll, if you're reading it in your Bible or here. Look at this. It says, And also Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, and the oldest brother of Japheth, children were born. Isn't that a bit confusing to you? I mean, it's all chopped up. But one of the major problems is that it says, and, um, and the older brother of Japheth. If he's the older brother of Japheth, that would mean Shem was the oldest, and that could be why he was put there uh, in, in the first slot of the name of the brothers. But look at the New King James Version. This version makes more sense and I believe is the ac more accurate. And that's a, the New American Standard Version is one of the closest to the original languages. When you have the spectrum of Bibles, there's all kinds of Bibles. And when you have the ones closest to the Greek or Hebrew, and then you have the standard versions. In fact, this is called the uh, New American Standard. And they strive to just stick right with the original languages. Then you go on the, the other end of the spectrum where they are least holding to the original languages. Those are called dynamic translations. And there you have like the Message Bible or the Living Bible. They're more like commentary than they are uh, translations because uh, you, you're not reading what the from the original writ manuscripts actually from the copies of the original manuscripts you're looking at, you're listening to some what somebody is saying about it and so what i'm saying is normally i have a new american standard version probably most of you in this congregation has that most of the time it's right but it's, i don't believe it is here look at the new king james version here how much smoother it reads and it makes a big difference by meaning, by saying that japheth was the elder here it is here. And the children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, 
the brother of Japheth, the elder. See the difference there? And so this is a, this is a mishmash here. I mean, it's... And also, to Shem, the, this is what I need to get to as well. In, in both of these, we have this phrase, the father of all the children of Eber. Here we have it here, the father of all the children of Eber. He inserts that. So what does that tell us? When in the Hebrew or Greek, when you're going along and then all of a sudden something is inserted and you think, what is it doing there? It's because it's significant. This, this guy, Eber, we're going to look at is, is significant. And one way we can tell is in the genealogy, it's talking about Shem. And before it says anything else, he, it's, it's noted that he's the father of all the children of Eber. So Eber must be somebody. And we'll see in a moment. So I take this to be the go-to translation here. I was going to try to doctor this one up and not even give you the new King James Version, but it's, it's hard to do. You'd have to put a parenthesis here. Parenthesis is just an idea inserted, and then the sentence continues. And so the father of all the children of Eber, and close it here, and you have another parenthetical here, the older uh, brother of Japheth, and close that, and then children were born, goes up here. And, to, and also to Shem, children were born. And all this is in between. Now you might have, if you read that, thought, well, I, that's kind of hokey and you just move on. I can't do that. And I was trying to slice and dice it. And I said, well, I'm just going to go with this because this is the one. And I went to five other translations. And five other translations all said that Japheth was the elder. I found one other one that said that uh, Japheth was the older, but I take it it is the New King James Version. It could be that in, there was some kind, of, uh, some kind of difference in the uh, manuscripts. So what we find in both cases is that Eber is the name that gives rise to the term term Hebrew, because when you see the, the word Hebrew in the English is spelled H-E-B-R-E-W, which is close to Eber. In other words, it was from that name that they got the Hebrew word Hebrew, which is first used of Abraham in Genesis chapter 14, verse 13. That's the first time that the word Hebrew is mentioned. And the name is patronymic. That's spelled P-A-T-R-O-N-Y-M-I-C. It means it's a father's name. It is related to fathers. So Eber is mentioned at the head of the list because of the importance of the Hebrew people. He is directly the son of Salah, which we see in Genesis 10:24. His placement at the head of the list, which is as soon as you see Shem, it says, okay, now we're going to talk about Shem, and it goes right to Eber. It's, that's because it's a, a vantage point of the Hebrew people. Abraham is the father of the Hebrew nation specifically. You find that in Hebrew, excuse me, uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. But Abraham descends from Eber and Eber from Shem. Now I know to some people that might not make any difference, but I am required to give, it, give Scripture to you accurately, and sometimes we have to go through some of the more boring things in order to get it accurate, but we want to get it accurate, and we see that the Bible puts a priority on anything that relates to Messiah. And all of this has to do with Jesus Christ. Because Shem is the one that the Bible talks about coming from the Messiah, uh, going back to Shem. And Eber, the Hebrew, and by the way, the, the Hebrew word Eber 
means one who crosses over. And in context, when Abraham, who was called by God, he lived in Ur of the Chaldees, and God called him to go to a land that he would tell him what it was. How would you like that? God would tell you, I want you and your, I want you and your, your wife to leave everything that you have now. And in order to do so, they had to cross the river. And that's where you get Hebrew. He had to cross over. He had to leave. He said, God said, leave, leave your family and start walking and I'll tell you what land I'm going to take you to. What would you say? Would you have any questions about that? You don't need questions. All you need to do is, you don't know, need to know the why or the where. All you need to know is the who. And God is the who. And so when they crossed over, they were called then Hebrews, and you have this name, Eber, embedded in Hebrew. Not exactly in the English, but you do in the Hebrew, and that's why this is brought out, and it's making a big deal about it here. Now, turn to verse 25. We're still in Genesis chapter 10. I'll put this one on the board as well. Uh oh. I was going to shake it to see if the batteries were working and one fell out. There it is. Okay. Um, this is Genesis 10 25. And two sons, this is referring of Shem, but this is still given the genealogy of Shem. And two sons of Shem were born to Eber. In fact, if you look in your Bible, if you have a Bible, you'll notice that Eber is, underline this, just underline it and it will stand out at you. In verse 21, which we just went over, it's talking about Eber. See it there? Underline it there. Drop down to verse 24, and there you have it. The last word in the sentence there is Eber. And now in verse 25, we have his name again, Eber. And I've given you the reasons why, but that's, when you see things like that in, in the Bible, it's not, it's not a coincidence. It's trying to tell you something. This is a big deal because of Jesus Christ and his line goes through these people. So, and the two sons of Shem were born to Eber. The name, the name of the one was Peleg, P-E-L-E-G, for in the days the earth was divided, his brothers, uh, the, the days the earth was divided. Then it says, and his brother's name was Joktan. We don't know too much about Joktan, but the reason this is significant is because it gives us a frame of reference as to when the Tower of Babel occurred. Because we know in Genesis uh, 10... Uh, verse 10, that this was, this was, uh, let's see, was it 10? Yeah, verse 8, 8 and 9. We know there that it was from Nimrod that, that was the one that cr was behind this, but we don't know a time element. So if you, the Bible is always drops hints and things here. So the timeline, we go to the middle of Shem's genealogy, and we see that this Eber that was so significant uh, had a son by the name of Peleg, and the, the name Peleg in the Hebrew means divided. And then it even tells us here, after one of Eber's sons named Peleg, for in his days, the time, the time that... Peleg lived, and his name mean divided, is when God divided the earth according to language. And so this gives us a time slot as to when this happens. For in the days of the earth was divided, and his brother name was Joktan. Okay, 
We won't read all the rest of these names. But we have the significant players, and now we're ready to look at Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, in the first nine verses, covers the Tower of Babel. That's not many verses. That's not much uh, space given to such a significant event, but it gives the details that we need to know. And I'm going to give you some introduction to this before we jump right into the text. You know, there's nothing wrong with building a tower. In fact, it must have seemed like a great idea at the time. A lot of them do. After all, Babel was surely a feat of architectural beauty, and it was bringing people together in a common cause. So what could possibly be wrong with getting together and building a significant structure? So what's the problem? Well, they did what man continues to do, and that is they ignored God's clear instructions in favor of their own wisdom. They were being defiant, disobedient. Why? What does Genesis chapter 9, 1 say? What did God tell, uh, tell Noah? And then he told them again after they got off the ark. Be fruitful and multiply and spread over the entire earth. Well, it's not only, it's nothing wrong with building an, a, a great edifice of some sort, but it was the mental attitude behind this edifice, this great city and a tower that they said was going to reach up to heaven, that was the problem behind it. Instead of spreading out and going everywhere, they said, no, let's, let's, let's get together, let's centralize. And we'll get into the scriptures which are more... Uh, defining, but we, we're just looking at the overall thing first. The first nine verses, we have a very important section that gives details of the first attempt of internationalism. Now you'll remember, I've already been pointing this out, that God has already separated the, the people into nations. Nationalism is biblical. Internationalism is not. Nationalism is by God internationalism is promoted by Satan. It has been ever since this time and still exists. I would say essentially that this was the first United Nations. Whatever a one world system teaches, propagates its doctrines and its objectives, that are the objective of Satan in its attempt to rule the world. In other words, what did Satan want to do? When Satan was the anointed cherub. He was the greatest creature that ever came from the hand of God. And for a while, he was phenomenal. But what, what was he guilty of? The big A. Arrogance. And he thought, well, I'm tired of taking all this worship that goes to God. Look at me. I'm somebody. I think I'll just have him worship me for a while. And he, you can go to Isaiah, the, the um, uh, five I wills, I will ascend to the top. And he said, essentially he says, I'll be God. And in order to further that, Satan promotes internationalism because when you have internationalism, it's easy to control people. Usually there's just a, a very few head people in internationalism. If you can... If you can manipulate them, you can manipulate the world. God says, no, many nations all, it's spread all over the earth, and it's nas na nationalism is of God. So these passages explain how the nations came to be scattered across the face of the ancient world. It's a message of judgment. What they prided themselves in became their own downfall, and they feared the most... They feared most what actually came upon them and you see that in Proverbs chapter 10 verse 24 curious want to know what Proverbs 10 24 says let's look okay Proverbs chapter 10 verse 24 
What the wicked fears will come upon him, and the desires of the righteous will be granted. So if you are one that is wicked, and you're always scheming and conniving, and you do fear something, there are things that you fear, they will come upon you, according to this passage in Proverbs, and that's Proverbs 10, uh, 24. What the wicked fears will come upon him, and the desire of the righteous will be granted. Everything that mankind proposed in the first half of Genesis 11, uh, 3 through 4, was disposed of in the second portion of the scripture. We're talking about the scriptures between verses 1 and 9 in Genesis 11 because that's given the details of the, of the Tower of Babel. And he's saying everything that mankind proposed in verses all the way up through verse 4 was disposed of by God in verses 5 through 9. Let's just read it. Let's go back to... Uh, Genesis chapter 11. <coughs> Is this one out? Oh, this one. Okay. Okay. No. Okay, I'm going to talk now. Uh, Genesis. <coughs> yeah. Hello? Okay. All right. Are y'all still with me? Okay. Uh, the Tower of Babel, starting with verse 1 of chapter 11. Now, the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves. I, I want you to underline some of these words as we go. One of them, ourselves. It's all about them. Is this working now? Okay, I want you to underline themselves. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. Uh, some translations say, come, let us build for us. That kind of rings out a little louder there. A city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven and let us make for ourselves, there you have it again, make for us, and for ourselves, a name, which means a reputation, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. You see the defiance here? In Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, and Genesis chapter uh, 9, verse 28, you have that same thing. Verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing which they have purposed to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their languages, their language that they may not understand one, another, one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth 
And they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, there's a lot you can take from that. But to start with, what we just read at the very last there, I think it's significant. Maybe you could underline this. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there. What was their intention? Let's make a capital city. Let's, let's have everybody come here and we're going to reach, we're going to build a tower that will reach to the heavens. Everything they're doing here is contrary to what God said. And rather than trust God in order to produce salvation, they were going to produce salvation themselves by building a tower that they could walk right up to heaven themselves. That's how silly it is to think that you can do what only God can do. So in this, we see that everything from verse 4 in chapter 11 is what they proposed to do. This is what they wanted to do. And everything from verse 5 through 9 was undone. So the very thing that they were wanting to do did not happen. The very thing that they did not want to happen happened. And again, we can go back to Proverbs 10, 24. What the wicked fears will come upon him. And the desire of the righteous will be granted. So God gave the command to scatter throughout the earth and form many nations. And in Genesis 11.1 1, and following we have the disobedience to the divine command. And Satan who is the ruler of the world attempting to destroy the divine order. That's always the case. And we have a wave after wave of internationalism today, in fact, our very nation is struggling to continue to be sovereign. Because you see, if the United States, like so many other countries in the world, buy into satanic global village nonsense, then our sovereignty will be gone. And we will buy into internationalism. And you hear it all the time. You see it on commercials. You hear pundits speak about, oh, it's so much greater to, to have this internationalism. And the more that we become internationalized, the less freedom we have. And one reason so many nations and people hate us is because of our Constitution. And what is unique about our Constitution is that it is the only nation that has ever based their government on the principle that our rights and our freedom come from God. And that is, you don't find that anywhere else. And so if you, have, if you go to internationalism, that has to cease to exist. And instead of us having individual rights, the right to worship as we please, the the right to say anything that we want to, even, it, even if it is excoriating the government and those in high places, the freedom of the press as well, they can print what they want to do. We can assemble. We can do all of these things. We can even back up our freedom by having our own weapons. And that is a God-given right. I don't care all the thousands of gun control uh, statutes and so forth or just a lot of tempest in a teapot, it means nothing. When it boils down to it, you have the right to defend yourself. That right comes from God. In my book, I have in Tolerating Tyranny, I go through, through biblical evidence, historical evidence, constitutional evidence, that indeed we not only have the right to own guns, we have the right to carry them. And we're here recently, ever since what happened in Florida, there is a gaggle of insane, self-promoting people that, have, are, that are trying to say, well, the problem is we have too many guns. First of all, how are you going to get 300 million guns out of the people's hands? If you could wave the magic wand and take every gun out of every law-abiding citizen's 
then crime would rise, it would not diminish. It is those law-abiding gun owners who, are, who have the right to defend themselves, and they do it every day. You don't hear about that, though. And even this nut job, uh, Nicholas, uh, he passed all the gun things anyway. Uh, we, we have a problem, and the, 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 it just exacerbates the issue when people are trying to take guns out of law-abiding citizens' hands. I mean, who is so stupid as to think, I'm going to pass a law, and that's going to take the guns out of the criminals' hands? By definition, they're criminals. They're not buying by the law anyway. And they can get a gun anywhere. Well, I got on my soapbox, but um, I don't remember how I did. <laughs> but I did. And I really am cutting it short because I have a lot more to say on that. <laughs> Some believe that the Tower of Babel wasn't a ziggurat with stairs to the top which was used to worship false gods because they were not worshiping a god but themselves. However, some believe that there were ziggurats in the area and that the Tower of Babel was one of them. Now, this is where I was going to show you. I guess I'll do it again here. The, some of you have probably seen this before. They come up all right? Well, it's kind of skinny. Well, um, this says, Europe, many tongues, one voice. Now, this was when they were, when the, um, the European Union was coming together. This was to promote it. And don't you think it's somewhat telling that they have what looks like the Tower of Babel here, a, a tower reaching to the skies. Of course, that wouldn't, most people, it, it wouldn't matter because they don't know what the Tower of Babel is from uh, the shell building in Houston. They don't know anything. But uh, anyway, and this is telling up here, these look like stars, don't they? But have you ever seen a star like that? This is what a star, whoop, excuse me. That's what a star looks like. These are not stars. These are demonic symbols. It's called the Goat of Mendez. And they've taken the star and turned it like this. And the reason they say it's, it, it's the goat, this would be the goatee or the goat's chin. This would be his ears and these are the horns coming out. Can you see that? Yeah. Well, they, it's, it's called the, the Goat of Mendez and it's a satanic symbol. And they have it on this and they have with it the Tower of Babel and their initiative, this, is, this isn't to condemn it. This is to promote it. This is a, a, a shot of a ziggurat. It's, it's where they uh, have a stairways going up. This is the, uh, let's see. Let me unscramble that. Here's another one. Now, these ziggurats also are found not just in the Middle East. They're found all over the world. They're, they're found in uh, South America, Central America. Uh, the, I went to one that I couldn't find a, a, a picture of it. But uh, Carrie and I went down to uh, Cozumel. And um, there was close to that. You go down. We had to go on a bus several, uh, probably an hour's drive to get to one of these ziggurats. It was in Chichen Itza, was the name of maybe Have y'all, some of y'all been there before? Well, it, it's, it's, when you go through there, you get an airy feeling because they have gargoyles, you know, what they, these monster teeth and all this. Uh, it's very satanic looking, but it's a beautiful place. And that ziggurat, right behind it was the water. And so you have a beautiful view of the water and you had, but, the whole idea was to go up here, all these steps, and get closer to, to your God. But it wasn't the true God. They would go up there and they would make human sacrifices. And they would uh, do all... And it, this was the first one here, started with the 
Tower of Babel. Now, the, the city and the, probably some, the, the tower came out of it. And what I'm saying is there was discussion as to, is, is this, was this a ziggurat? Did it look like this? Or like this? When it could have looked like this. I've seen, see this is, I've seen where the, the stairs twirl around to get up to the top. That's not a ziggurat. And it's not, it's not a big deal, uh, really, whether, they were, whether it was a ziggurat or not. We're talking about the construction of this m massive project. But the main thing is that they were not doing it in order to worship a false god. They were worshiping themselves. And these, this, this whole idea of this, this, this idea that came from Nimrod and the Tower of Babel continued to spread all over the earth and you have uh, this evidence. You can go there and see the ruins now. Okay, so I wanted to show you that. So what is this? This is a human effort to do what only God can do. They thought that if they could just provide themselves with enough fame and fortune, there would be heaven on earth. Huh. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it, today, what people are trying? Why have one national language? Why is that important? And I have... I won't be able to get very far into this, but uh, this is a quote from a guy named Stadish Chandra Verma from the Universitat des Sarlandes. So he doesn't sound American to me. <laughs> but you don't have to be American to understand this principle that he gave. This was a response in a blog, and this is what he said. Native language is the means of identification in this world. Did you hear that? Native language is the means of identification in this world. And I, I thought about that. I thought, you know, if you go, like, they're having the Olympics and all, and it, people, for the most part, look the same, especially if you're from America, because we have Heinz 57 here, and everybody looks different. So how can you identify those who may be American. Just speak to them. See, you identify people by their language. And this is what he's saying. He said, this is... <clears throat> this... This is a device to preserve your own rich cultural heritage, traditional values, and all the valuable knowledge for generations yet born. That is, having one... National language. National or official languages are mentioned in over 150 constitutions. The need and importance of a national language cannot be denied. Every nation needs some marks of identity. Language is the prime mark of identification for any nation. The national language creates a feeling of unity and national cohesion. People living in different provinces realize that in spite of speaking different languages, they are joined together by one national language, which is the heritage of all. That means if you have more than one language, it's that still that one national language that is the glue. How many, by the way, how many languages do you think are spoken in the U.S.? Well, I have it up there. Sorry about that. <laughs> I knew something was wrong when De Dennis got the right answer. <laughs> you got to be quick to be a roper. <laughs> yeah. 381 languages. By the way, I don't know about you, every time I pick up the phone and they say, um, for Spanish, push one. Why do I have to go out of my way to push one when it's my language, is English? Why don't they have to go out of their way to push one for Spanish? Well, I don't know, it's just... 
That's those little things that can get under your skin. If any of you had that rebound when it says push one for Spanish? I bet if you go to Mexico, they don't say push one for Spanish. <clears throat> a spokeswoman for the U.S. English Foundation said it, deserve, it is a diverse society from a language perspective that we have to make sure that everyone can speak English rather than separate people along ling linguistic lines. Do you know how many uh, different languages are, are, are in the California school system? 220. And 44% of the re re residents in California speak a language other than English at home. And 7 million Californians say they can't speak English well. The top of that, on top of that, the California's judicial system is considered the largest in the nation, surpassing the size of the entire labyrinth of the federal courts. That's, that's a big judicial system in California. And this judge at uh, Morano Florentino Cellular said, on the, uh, said about the state's effort to expand courtroom translation program, just finding enough trained interpreters have proved daunting and the state's courts handle as many as 8 million cases a year. And when you have 8 million cases and you have nearly half of the people not speaking English and there's 220 languages just in the school, how do you, how do you handle that? I'll tell you how you handle it. You just say, learn to speak English. If you're going to live here, learn to speak the language. And you, what, what, what would happen if somebody that didn't speak English called and it didn't say speak one for Spanish? What do you think would happen? I think they might learn English. Well, the time has passed. So, <clears throat> what did we get today? Well, we saw that even in genealogy there are important facts. And you know, if you just read your Bible, which I, I continue to encourage you to do, you won't understand it all, but if you read it slowly and you're looking, you'll find these kind of things even in genealogy that impart it so you can connect the dots. Also, we see that we live in a time when Internationalism is all pervasive and there is an unseen war going on for the freedom of our country and the sovereignty of our country. And not only is the Constitution the law of the land, that is, all the laws that are passed that are pursuant and are subordinate to the Constitution are the laws of the land. And internationalism is a rude intruder. We need to recognize it as such. And we need to speak out. That's another thing we can speak out on. And we can speak out not only defending it by the Constitution, we can do it with the Bible as well. I'd like everyone please to bow your heads. This last portion of the scripture is dedicated to anyone who is not familiar with the gospel. If you're afraid of what's going to happen to you after you die... There's no need for it because you can settle it right here and now. In a moment, just recognizing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went to the cross to, to die for your sins, my sins as well, the sins of the whole world. He died on that cross. He said it is finished. His mission had been accomplished. He was buried and then he rose from the grave and he offers eternal life to anyone who will trust Him and Him alone for it. It only is given as a gift. The harder you work for it, the further away you get from it. And so all you have to do in order to receive that gift of salvation is to put your faith alone in Christ alone. And in that moment you do that, you're born again. You become a royal family member of the Most High. 
Your ticket to heaven is guaranteed. And now you can grow in grace and knowledge and not only live the abundant life here on earth, but also anticipate great rewards and decorations and privileges for all eternity. And it's all because of His grace. Now, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to fellowship in the Word this morning. We pray that we will think about these things, that we will look for opportunities in order to help others and to speak out about our mighty God and His mighty Word. We pray this all in Christ's most high and holy name. Amen.